Well, turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. We're going to stay right in that locality because we're going to read from Luke, John, and then Mark. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. This message has been burning in my heart all week, and I have been waiting to release it to the church today. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. Have you got it in your Bibles there today? Amen. For the Son of Man, that is Jesus, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Everybody say lost. John 4 verse 35. Say ye not that there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, ready, all ready to harvest. Speaking about souls. Don't say there's time. Don't wait until a better time. The time is now, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. Mark chapter 16 verse 15 says, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I want to minister today from my heart to your heart. I want to minister this title. The bottom line is souls. The bottom line is lost souls. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Hallelujah. Let's just worship him right now and just begin to prepare our hearts. Jesus, thank you, Lord, that you saved us. Thank you, Lord. Once I was lost, but now I am found. Thank you, Lord, for salvation today. Thank you for the cross, Lord, that even while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Speak to our hearts today. Lord, speak to every heart. Renew and revive us, Lord. Our purpose, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. You may be seated. I told you, I'm going to put my heart out there today because I cannot stress enough the importance of people knowing Jesus Christ. People knowing Jesus Christ. I want to tell you today that all people everywhere must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. All people everywhere must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what got into my heart and my spirit to preach this message, because God spoke to me through the strangest thing. You see, recently in, in uh, Canberra, there was a, they have been focusing in the news the amount of people that are going bushwalking and up into the mountains that aren't prepared and they get lost. And they are trying to educate people about how to be prepared to live in the bush or how to be prepared to survive overnight, what to take and all those things. And the Canberra Weekly, which isn't really the preeminent <laughs> news publication, but it captured my attention. It said this, you can read that little title down the bottom below the picture. The bush capital is, the bush capital is great, except when you're lost. And that really, really hit me right in my heart. Canberra is a great place, except if you're lost. And we are here in the kingdom for such a time as this. You see, the bottom line, church, is lost souls. We are called to reach the lost. Every person everywhere must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The bush capital is great, except if you are lost. Nothing stirs our heart than to hear that somebody's lost. Recently, we know the tragic report of the people in the submarine that was lost. It got the attention of the whole world. We were focused on this lost submarine. It got the whole world's attention. We were writing on every story. We were counting down all of the hours, wondering if they would be, wondering when they would be found. 
Then there's stories about children who have wandered off and got lost. Stories about people who were hiking in the mountains and got lost. You see, the news covers all of the, the stories. As the days go on, we, that hopelessness begins to settle in and, and, and we begin to worry and wonder what's going to happen to the lost people. And as much as that stirs our heart emotionally, I would hate to imagine what the loved ones and the friends of those people are going through. Maybe you've known someone that's been lost. Maybe you've been in that situation. But even that, when I consider the thoughts and the emotions of how we feel when somebody is lost, we must ask ourselves, how must, must the Lord Jesus Christ feel about a lost world? Who He has given us the mandate and the mission that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. How will they hear unless somebody tells them? Church, I want to tell you, the bottom line of all of this is that every soul, every person must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The bottom line is souls because Jesus cares about souls. He came to seek and to save the lost. We've been called to go and tell somebody the gospel of Jesus Christ. You boil it all down. Church can become complicated. It can become, you know, all these programs and all that. And that's all great and that's wonderful. But the bottom line is lost souls. The mission and mandate of the church is to reach lost souls, to disciple people, to disciple followers of Jesus Christ. And it's my responsibility as a pastor to make sure that we know it is our responsibility to carry the gospel. And let me tell you, let me apologize right now because some of us have forgotten what it's all about. Some of us have been a long time since we told anybody our testimony. Some of us, it's been a long time before we shared a scripture with somebody or we told someone that we're praying for them. It's been a long time. And there's, if you're gonna lay the blame at anyone's feet, lay it at mine because I haven't brought it before you enough. I, have, I want you to feel encouraged. I want you to be blessed. I want you to learn the Word of God, but lay the blame right at this preacher's feet because I haven't brought it before you enough. We have a world to reach. There are lost souls that we gotta reach. It is our mandate. It is our mission. The bottom line is lost souls. I'm not gonna let you get out of this place today without feeling the burden for lost people, lost family members, lost colleagues. I tell you, everybody everywhere needs to hear about Jesus. They took the cross off Calvary Hospital and that devastated us. But you know what, you and I, you know, that cross wasn't doing much, it was just up there. You and I are carriers of the message of the cross. We are the ones, they may take the cross out of everywhere, but they can't stop the church of the living God because it's inside of us. We gotta preach the gospel. The bottom line is lost souls. Oh, from the, from the front door to this pulpit, let me tell you what it's all about. It's about lost souls. We must have a burden for the lost. And that's what happens. I woke up last, last weekend, a lot of people, a lot of Christians getting into the Christian industry, you know, all the preaching, all the books, all of these things, the new fads and all of that stuff. And we love our little Christian industry, our little Christian club, but we forget many Christians aren't sharing the gospel. That's the bottom line. Unless they hear the gospel, unless they obey the gospel, they will not be saved. Let me tell you, uh, we need books to encourage us. Yeah, we needed conferences. They're all great. We need all of those things. But very often what can happen is that we get so caught up in the Christian industry and being around other Christians and conferences and all that, and we forget what it's all about. It's not about the people that are in here. This is not a place that, it's not just about coming to church. Church is a place we come to, but ultimately is a place that we go from. Because you come here and God speaks. You come here and God refreshes. You come here and God refuels. And then you go. Everybody say go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so Christians get dissatisfied. Why? Why do they go from fad to fad and this and that and all that? Why? Because they got their eyes off their purpose is to reach lost souls. You will always struggle. Write this down. Remember it. You will always struggle if you are a pond that water runs into and doesn't run out of. 
me say that again. You will always struggle if you are a pond that water runs into and doesn't run out of. Your life will begin to become stagnate. Your life will begin to smell. You'll begin to become dissatisfied because it's not about gimme, gimme, gimme. It's about go, go, go. (laughs) You see, we are called to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. We're to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We are are to reproduce ourselves. Follow me as I follow Christ. And reproduction is the goal of every living thing. The Bible is full of reproductive language. The Bible is full of agricultural language. All through the Gospels you see it. We are to make disciples. Follow me as I follow Christ. And yes, it's true that the pastors, the elders, the apostles in the New Testament, they made disciples. It's true. But we can overlook the fact very easily that it is everyone's responsibility. If God has saved you, why would you keep it to yourself? If he brought you out of addiction, why would you keep it to yourself? If he brought you out of all sorts of mess, why would you keep it to yourself? We cannot overlook the fact that the bottom line for every single one of us is go into all the world and preach the gospel. The bottom line is lost souls. Let me say this, he could have called Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, he didn't. He called you and I to match us with these last days. In these last days, we are the church. And let me ask you some questions. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? You have come into the kingdom. For such a time as this, there are people in your life, there are people in your circle, please forgive me, I'm getting passionate today, but there are people in your circle that need Jesus Christ. They need to hear it and you're the one who knows. What is the purpose of Calvary Chapel? Let me tell you, every time, I don't know if you noticed, but every time you walk out those front doors, there's a little sign right above the doors. What's it say? Go make disciples go make disciples that is our purpose we live and we exist to make Jesus known what is a disciple that's good that's a good question it's not somebody that just believes in Jesus a disciple is someone who is following you can write this down somebody who is following Jesus living according to his word obeying his word all of those things following Jesus but not just following a disciple will then begin to serve Jesus and then they will grow everyone say grow you see doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian you never reach a place where you stop growing because we never stop being disciples and true disciples make disciples. And that's the way we reach the world. If, you would re- if every one of us would reach one and that one would reach one, it wouldn't take long. We'd make a big impact in this world. Go make disciples. When you think about loved ones that have gone, you reflect on their last words. Someone say last words. As you sit here today, Some of you can easily reflect on the passing of a loved one and you remember the last words because last words are important, very important. Let's reflect on Jesus' last words. In the book of Matthew, the four gospels, he said, go, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, there it is, go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching, everyone say teaching. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There are some key words right there in Matthew. Go, make disciples, baptize, teach. The book of Mark, the words are there again. Go ye into all the world and preach. Go, preach. He that believeth and is Baptize. There they are again. The last words of Jesus. Go, preach, baptize. The book of Luke. And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in His name. Repentance. Go. What are we to preach? Repentance and remission of sins in whose name? Jesus' name. 
to all nations, beginning where? Beginning where you are. Begin where you are. And sometimes the harvest can be daunting when we look at the whole world. But we are told to begin where you are. Begin in your Jerusalem. John chapter 20, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me. Why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. You say, well, how am I going to do that, Pastor? I, I'm not very smart. I'm not a theologian. Let me tell you how you're going to do it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're going to have a goosebump machine. No, it doesn't say that. You're going to feel good. No, it doesn't say that. What's the power of the Holy Ghost? So you can brag and rev your engine to everybody else. No. And you, and you shall be witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit is given to us to be witnesses. To be witnesses. You've got the power of God inside of you. The first and most important purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is to be a, a witness. And you shall be witnesses. Here it is. In Jerusalem. Everyone say Canberra. In Judea. Everyone say our region. And in Samaria. Everyone say Australia. And into the uttermost parts of the earth, everyone say the world. Start where you're at. You are empowered in the, with the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. Souls was Jesus' mission. He talked about it. A whole chapter in Luke chapter 15, that trilogy of stories about lost sheep, lost coins, and a lost son. Why did Jesus give us three stories about the lost so that people could grasp so that you and I in 2023 could grasp how eternally important it is to reach lost souls. He says, how many of you would have a hundred sheep and if you lose one, doth not leave the 90 and nine in the wilderness and go looking for the one? And when he hath found the one, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. Let me tell you, Jesus cares about the one in the 100. He cares about every lost soul. And some of us would have an attitude, well, let's just count the losses. We got 99. Let me tell you, I'm not a pastor that's willing to count the losses. I'm going to go after the one. I'm going to go after that person. I'm going to call you. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to come visit you. I'm going to have lunch with you. I'm going to chase. Yeah, the church may be full, but as long as there's one, Jesus cares. And why shouldn't we? Then he tells about the lady who had 10 coins and she lost one. Jesus cares about the one lost coin. Jesus cares about the lost son as well. The one in two, the one in 10, the one in 100. Why were those stories told? Jesus, it concerned Jesus. They were concerned. They said, Jesus is focusing on sinners. Oh, he eats with them. He receives them. Why? You know, see, they were not concerned that people were lost the only thing that they were concerned with is that they weren't the center of Jesus' attention anymore. And that could be us. That we get to the point where we want to be the center of Jesus' attention all the time. And he says, no, you won't get my attention. Go be a soul winner. Go reach some people for Jesus. You see, they said, you receive sinners and you eat with them. They were not concerned. They said, we just want his attention. What about the woman? She swept the house. Everyone say she swept the house. She turned everything upside down to find the one lost coin. And she said, rejoice with me. I have found the peace that was lost. And then Jesus said, likewise, I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Somebody say amen. You see, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Yes, he saved you and I. I'm thankful that he picked me up out of the miry clay. I'm thankful that I know Jesus Christ, but I've got an obligation. I've got a mandate. I've got a mission. I got to tell somebody else about Jesus. I don't know what we misunderstand as Christians. I guess when I, I typed the word lost into, into the computer and some words came up, I could say they were very passive words, lost. Words like absent, disorientated, hidden, invisible, misplaced. They're the words, and maybe that's why 
We don't have such a burning in our heart for lost people because we think we have a wrong understanding of what it means to be lost, misplaced, disorientated. Now, yeah, I may, I may misplace my cell phone, my phone. I may, I mis, may misplace it. I may get disorientated at times. I may, or you may be absent from school. But when it comes to the human soul, when it comes to our family members, when it comes to our classmates, when it comes to our colleagues and our neighbors, they're not misplaced. They're not absent. They're not dis disorientated. Let me tell you, they are lost. They are lost. And what does the Bible speak about lost? When you read, when you read the account of Zacchaeus, Jesus even knew where he was. Jesus knew where Zacchaeus was. In fact, Jesus was with him physically. He wasn't disorientated. He wasn't absent. He wasn't misplaced. Zacchaeus was lost. Why? Because he was a sinner. When you read about in the, the prodigal son, the account of the prodigal son helps us understand what loss means. When the father got his son back, he said, this my son was dead. He hadn't physically died. He said, this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. You see, to the father, a lost son was a dead son. You see, when we are in sin, we are not just misplaced or absent. We are lost. We are outside of the plan of God. I'll tell you today, listen to this preacher, outside of Jesus Christ, we are dead. We are lost. We are hopeless. We've, everybody's got to hear the message of the cross. Oh. If you've become bored with your Christian walk, let me tell you, get back on your assignment. The bottom line is lost souls. Go tell somebody your testimony. Go tell someone about the good news of salvation. Uh, if you can't tell them, bring them to church. Bring, bring someone to your home group. Do a Bible study with someone. Come alongside someone and lead them to Jesus. They are not lost on an island. Let me tell you, they're lost for eternity unless we tell them about Jesus. Old fashioned, yes, but it's the bottom line. The sheepfold, lost people matter to God. The sheepfold was a place of comfort. The sheepfold was a place of safety. The sheepfold was a place of nourishment. And that's all good. The church is the sheepfold. Everyone say the sheepfold. And it's important to be in the sheepfold. It's important to come to church and hear the word of God. It's important that we are in fellowship. Even the apostles, they continued in breaking of bread and fellowship. All of those things are important. But the church is not just a place we come to. It's a place that we go from. Don't get so comfortable in the sheepfold that this is where you stay. Jesus said, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. I'm telling you to, when, yeah, go leave the sheepfold. Go, go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Is it comfortable? No, you're a sheep in the midst of wolves. But Jesus said, I send you forth. Why? Because there are lost souls. <laughs> yeah. The world, sometimes we can become so cocooned in our Christianity. That the world, it's not familiar, it's not comfortable. It's definitely not safe, but it's our great commission. Jesus said, I send you forth. You see, airlines, when you get on the airline, <laughs> they tell you straight up, your safety is our first and most important task. Yeah, yeah. You, we, we, we want you to be comfortable, but your safety is the most important thing. On the airlines, they tell you, they spend a lot of time telling you about your safety. And in this church, yeah, we want you to be comfortable. But the most important thing is salvation. Somebody say amen. amen. The most important thing is salvation. Salvation comes before self-help. Salvation comes before physical healing. Salvation comes before personal fulfillment. Salvation comes before Bible history. Salvation comes before a positive mental attitude. Let me tell you, salvation is the most important thing. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Hallelujah. Huh. In a true apostolic church, the most important thing is anything to do with salvation. Let me tell you, all miracles are minor when compared to salvation. 
All miracles are minor. You may get a, a miraculous healing, but compared to salvation, it's minor. Even Jesus told us that. The scripture tells us throughout the scripture, we see miracles, signs and wonders in all different shapes and sizes. We see the food multiplied. We see demons cast out. We see people delivered. We see all sorts of instant healings, instant miracles, all sorts of illnesses. God is great and He can do great things. And we are told that those things will continue. Jesus said, and you will do those things, even greater things, He said. He said, you will see miracles. And all of those things we see in the Word of God and we see them still happening. I am a walking miracle myself. Born having seizures, born with potential brain damage as the specialist said, but healed by the power of God. I'm a walking miracle myself. There are many miracles in this house. I prayed for a little baby this morning. She's a little miracle. She's a blessing. There's a lot of miracles in this house. A lot of people can testify that you've been delivered. Somebody here has been delivered of 11 years of a heroin addiction. That is a miracle. And we can rejoice over that. But the greatest miracle is salvation. All miracles are nothing compared to salvation. Let me tell you, don't focus on the miracles, the signs and the wonders. Don't be a sign seeker. Be a disciple maker. Tell somebody about Jesus. Get back on task. You see, Jesus in Mark chapter 6 verse 5, when Jesus returned to his hometown, he was met with so much unbelief. So much unbelief. Mark chapter 6 verse 5, he was met with so much unbelief. He said, I couldn't do any mighty works there. Everyone say, no mighty works. No mighty works. Except lay hands on a few sick people and healed. Healed them. So he laid hands on a few sick people and they were healed. And you know what? It was not even considered a mighty work. No. We would, we would, we would run. Oh! Jesus said, couldn't do nothing. No mighty works. Just laid my hands on a few people and they all got healed. What about Luke chapter 10? If the musicians could come. Luke 10 verse 17 to 20. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Wow, a subject to us through your name. Wow, Jesus, we have spiritual authority through the power of Jesus, through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We have spiritual authority. Wow, 70 of them came running back to Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, you know what? Satan is far from invincible. Why are you so surprised? He said, I, I, beheld, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He says, you have power. I gave you the power. Don't come bragging to me. I gave it to you. Satan is far from invincible. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power. Jesus said, why are you so surprised? I gave you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Don't be surprised. What did he say? Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. Don't rejoice in those things. They're not mighty works. They're not the greatest, most important thing. Rejoice not in this. Rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Your names are written in heaven. The greatest miracle is the miracle of salvation. The greatest miracle is somebody going from death to life. The greatest miracle is someone going from lost to found. The greatest miracle is somebody goes from being a lost soul to a found soul. I tell you today, church, the bottom line is a lost and dying world. We gotta reach lost souls. It's a bottom line, church. Oh, it's the bottom line. Refocus on the eternal church. You see, salvation is the greatest miracle. Why? Because it never expires. It never expires. Salvation stretches into eternity. It stretches into eternity. Your physical healing has an expiration date. It has an expiration date. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but focus on the eternal. Don't be consumed with the temporal. Jesus even said, it's better to go to heaven without one arm. It's better to go to heaven without one eye than to go to hell with a beautiful healed body. Let's all stand.
God, he's moving on people's hearts right now. (laughs) September 11 was a terrible thing. It rocked the whole world. But after when it was all said and done, the people said, who knew about this and didn't tell anyone? Could be the greatest crime known to man to know the truth and to not share it. People need the Lord. There is a world groping in darkness, church. As a pastor, you know, sometimes we're insulated in church because Christian family and church family. But as a pastor, when you start dealing with people with broken, messed up lives, they're groping, looking for something. Let us not be somebody that knows but doesn't tell. I'll tell you a story about a man. His name was Don Ritchie. For almost half a century, Don Ritchie would go up to people at a place in Sydney called The Gap. He lived in a beautiful house in Watson's Bay, just 50 metres from The Gap. The Gap was known as a place where people would go to take their life, hopelessness. He would approach them, the story says, with his palms facing up. And he would simply walk to them as they stood on the ledge. He said, is there anything I can do to help you? Simple. Is there anything I can do to help you? Don Ritchie said, don't underestimate the power of a kind word and a smile. Sometimes they would call him the angel or the watchman of the gap. In his retirement, he sat there looking out his window over that beautiful view of the harbour headland. He would see someone coming down and he learned to read their body language. He could tell if they were troubled. He could tell almost what they were about to do. And he would go down there. He would spot them there and he would say, is there something I can do to help you? Would you like to come back to my house? We'll talk. Would you like to come and have a cup of tea in my house? Yes, he was awarded with the Medal of the Medal of the Order of Australia, was named Australia's local hero in 2011. And he was acknowledged that he saved at least 160 people from taking their lives. Beautiful. He said, the first time that I spotted someone on the ledge, I may have just 50 yards away. I could see them through my living room window. There was no question that I would go and help. He would, he would soon again go again and again and again and again for 50 years. What was he doing? Offering them a tea, offering them a personal invitation to come and eat. He physically removed some people off the cliff. Once he laid down on his stomach, reaching over the cliff to grab them by the hand and hold their hand. Tell them, there's still hope. There's still hope. He said, one day I looked out my bedroom woman, w- window and I saw a woman sitting on the cliff's edge. He said, I got dressed as quickly as I could. I went over, she had already put her handbag and her shoes outside the fence. He said, that was pretty common. I said to her, why don't you come over and have a cup of tea? And she obliged. He said, nothing was more beautiful than a few months later she came back. She bought me a beautiful gift. She said, you saved my life. How much more important I lost souls. There's some Don Richies here today. I, I, he probably never imagined that we'd be preaching about him because he inspires us, but that's all temporal. You see, he became known. If you go there and visit, I encourage you to go there and visit. It's a solemn place. But he came known as the angel of the cap. People would try to praise him. He shrugged it off. He said, patrolling the gap, patrolling the gap was my duty. Let me tell you, every single one of us, patrolling the gap is our duty. We are angels of the gap to bring people from death to life, to bring lost souls to Jesus. We must renew our passion for the lost. If you're not right with God today, don't let me admit this opportunity. If you're backslidden today, if your heart is cold, make it right with God. Make sure of your salvation. 
draw near to God and he will draw near to you but for everybody else here the bottom line is lost souls hallelujah let's just dwell on what God has been speaking to your heart right now not not on what I said but on what God has been speaking to your heart Lord lay a soul upon my heart Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, God, let's pray. Oh, yes. I got some cards right here before we come to this altar. But I wonder if somebody would. I, I, I drove our office staff crazy this week. Told them I want every suburb of Canberra. Written on a piece of paper so we can pray. Anybody live in Canberra? I want someone to pray for Canberra. What about Russell? What about Watangra? What about Kawula? What about Kuma? What about Kuma? What about Yas? What about Weston? What about Amaru? What about Simonston? What about Hall? What about Whitlam? What about Thawa? What about Cook? What about Macquarie? What about Uriara Village? What about Gugong? What about Torrens? What about Strathnairn? What about Goulburn? What about Fishwick? What about Ford? What about Wright? What about Dunlop? What about Latham? What about Pierce? What about Michelago? What about Collector? What about Coombs? What about Reed? What about Chifley? What about Melba? What about Curtin? What about Greenlight? I never knew there was such a suburb. What about Bruce? What about Sterling? What about Watson? What about Higgins? What about Gowrie? What about Lyons? Are you feeling a burden? What about McKellar? What about Chapman? People need the Lord, brothers and sisters. People need the Lord. I wonder if there's somebody here that would commit to praying for our city, praying for lost souls. I wonder if there's somebody here that would give themselves to telling somebody about Jesus. Don't worry, I'm not afraid of the quiet. Don't worry. God's moving in people's hearts. Lost souls. The bottom line, church, is lost souls. Family members, friends, schoolmates. People need the Lord. Let's lift our hands right now and let God get a hold of our heart. Let God give us a burden. Because the bottom line is lost souls. Yes. Intercede and pray. Hallelujah. With groanings and intercessions, the Bible says, for lost souls. Sing, Brother Akbar. If you want to come down to this altar right now, take one of these cards. It doesn't have to be your suburb. It can be another suburb, but commit to pray. Because the bottom line is lost souls.